Welcome uh, everyone to the second uh, session, Columbus Strategic Director and co-founder Rami Ismail will be with us. Benefiting from uh, games and uh, career and design are some of the six shapes of game design. So I would like to now leave the floor to uh, Miss uh, Ismail. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for participating. So uh, you can start anytime you want. Uh, you can start sharing your screen right now. I'll be here if you need any help. OK. Um, then let's get started. I wanted to talk. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the six shapes that I use um, to help me guide my game development and to help me guide my creative thinking. Um, so I have a little presentation for you. I'll go through it a little quickly, so we might have some time for Q and A. Uh, this is a pretty default Zoom interface, so if you are watching, there um, there's a way to just click Q&A, ask some questions. I'll try and answer as many as I can at the end of this talk. Um, so we're going to be talking about the six shape of game design, um, the six shapes that I've learned over my career that have helped guide me uh, become a better game designer. Uh, before we start, my name is Rami Ismail. I used to be one half of Dutch independent game studio Vlambeer. Um, right now, I am an independent consultant and contractor. I'm also known as an industry ambassador. I'm best known for my work on Game Dev World, Press Kit, Indie Mega Booth, Indie Fund, the IGDA, and Vlambeer. So, to not waste too much time on who I am, uh, let's get to uh, what I do. Um, these are the six shapes. And the six shapes are methods of thinking. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not just the shape that's important. It's uh, a combination of the shape and what, it, and what it represents, right? So we're gonna go through each of these six and talk about why they matter and how they can help you be a better game designer. So we'll start with the first shape. And the first shape is really simple. If you are a game developer, you're working in a field called human-computer interaction. A human-computer interaction is the way a computer interacts with a human. Now, the human-computer interaction model is extremely relevant for video games because it defines the way information travels between a computer and a person and how information travels from a person back into a computer. So for example, imagine that in the top right arrow, we have the player. Um, player. And then the player has an input based on what they want to do. And then the input goes into the game. And then the game has an output. Right? You can, for, you can simplify this whole thing by looking at it like this. Now, the player has, um, has an intent. They have an understanding of what is supposed to be happening in the game. Based on that intent, they give an input. That input is a button, but it might also be, um, it might also be an analog stick. It might be a trigger. It might be many of those things. Um, anything that the game can read, connect, webcam, sound, whatever, counts as input, right? Now, the input goes into the game, and the game processes that input and creates a delta or a changed state. What is happening in the game changes based on your button. If you press up, the coordinate of your character changes, right? Uh, if you press space, the character might start to jump. If you click the mouse, the character might shoot, right? Then the delta is communicated to the player via output. And the output is your graphics, your audio, your haptic feedback, whatever it is. All that information goes back into the player. Now, what is really important to understand about our job is that the entire video game, everything about the video game takes place here. 
This is where games happen. Games don't happen in the video game. Games happen in the head of the player. Nothing about a video game is real unless the player believes it. And nothing about a video game matters unless it matters to the player. So if you're a gamer, think of your favorite games world, your favorite character, your, your, the game with your proudest high score, and think for a moment about how they tricked you into believing that these things mattered. Those characters are obviously not real. They're polygons, they're voice lines, they're scripting. And that high score that you have, it's just a number. But the reason that number matters, the reason that high score matters, the reason that character matters, that world matters, is because they made us care enough in our own head. And because it's in our own head, because we believe it, because we've made it happen in our brains, it matters to us. Because really what a game is out doing, it's simply updating the screen and the audio based on input every time. And if, if people are only seeing that technical part, there's no video game. The nice thing about this means is that it means we can lie. We don't actually have to do everything. We just have to make people believe that we're doing anything, which is why we're using sky boxes instead of simulating the sky. But it's also why when you roll the dice, you can actually cheat and just give players a high number if they have some bad luck, right? You can make a gun feel more powerful than it actually is by using screen shake. You can make the health bar have 90% uh, have 90 of the health bar be 50% of the health and have the final 10% also be 50% of your health so that when a, when a player gets shot or damaged, their health bar will go really fast and then it will feel like they're almost dying, but they still have quite a bit of health left and then they recover, right? It doesn't matter how you cheat. As long as the player believes it, it's game design. As long as you can make the player believe it, it's game design. So stop trying to make fair games. Stop trying to make games that are technically correct. Nobody cares. Make games that make the player believe. That's your only goal. That's your only mission. It's the only thing that matters is that you can make the player believe right there in their mind that you can affect that intent that the player has, that choice the player wants to make, that you can steer that input. That's game design. All of this, the, all the other stuff, the, the stuff with the game and the Delta and the I don't know what, this is not video game. That has nothing to do with video game. The only thing that's video game is the player's mind, okay? So let's move to the second shape then. The second shape is a split. There is an area above and below the split which means that we have separated things into two. Now, there are two reasons I think that split is helpful and relevant. The first one is I think it's a really good way for people to understand the difference between a noun and a verb. If you are a game designer, if you're a game developer, I need you to understand this difference. A noun is any object, right? Um, camera, screen, microphone, uh, human, uh, Rami, uh, light, zoom, those are nouns. Verbs are things you do, which is talk, uh, look, uh, listen, verb, right? Now, when you think about your game or your project, you probably have a lot of nouns in there, right? A lot of objects. Uh, house, road, tree, sword, uh, gun, um, stuff like that. Lots, lots of nouns. You might also have some verbs, walk, jump, fight, race, stuff like that, drift, whatever, right? Now, I need you to think for one moment about how expensive each of these is to make. How much effort does it cost to make a noun? Well, a noun, you know, it costs money, it costs time, right? A verb, however, a verb costs a lot more. Verbs are the expensive part of game design. Verbs are the part of game design that can really mess your game up. So when you're making a game, think about how can I minimize 
the amount of verbs that I'm using while still delivering the experience that I want to deliver, right? Do I really need item management? Do I really need double jump? Do I really need talking to mind reading? Do, what, what do I need? Because every time you add a verb, it becomes more expensive to add another verb. When you're adding a noun, the cost is pretty linear. When you're adding a verb, the cost escalates. Every verb you add makes it more expensive to add more verbs. Now, I want you to keep that. I want you to keep that in mind because it is so important to understand as a game designer, the difference between a noun, which is content and a verb, which is mechanical. Just look at your game design next time and try to look, what are we adding to the game? Are we adding a verb? Are we adding a noun? And if we're adding a verb, are we ready for the costs that verb will bring to the game, right? Okay, so let's move to the next shape then. The next shape is these circles. And these circles, I don't know who came up with the idea for these circles. I don't remember when I started using them, but I started using them many years ago to figure out a game design. So core, the inner circle is core. The second circle is mechanics. The third circle is declarative. And the final circle is meta. Okay. So the first circle, it's really simple. At this first circle, this inner circle sits at the core of your game, the heart of your game, the most important thing about your game. And I want you to think about this, not a little bit. No, I want you to think about this properly because the core is what everything matters, is, is what matters most. It's what everything in your game is supposed to, to rotate again. It's like the gravity center, the heart, the core of your game is right there. And a lot of people say, well, the game has to be fun. That's not a core. That's not a thing. That's like saying like, it has to be engaging. It doesn't actually mean anything. It's a meaningless word. It's abstract. There's no, there's no heft to it. There's no weight to it. Uh, if you're going to make a game that's fun, you're going to make a bland game, a boring game, a generic game. I don't want to play that game that's fun, not because I don't like fun, but because there's many ways of using fun. Is it exciting fun? Is it challenging fun? Is it fun that makes me think, right? What is your game trying to be? What is at the heart of your game? I made a game called Luft Trousers, which was about airplanes flying, right? It was an action game, pretty simple arcade game. You fly around, you shoot enemies. It was fun, right? At the core of that game, said the idea that you were gonna be the coolest fighter pilot in the world the coolest fighter pilot that had ever existed. And you know how we did that? When we started, we just had a little prototype, tiny prototype, 2D airplane that would rotate and you could fly it around. And if you would turn off the engine, it would start falling, but you could turn around while you were falling, shoot enemies behind you, and then turn your engine back on and shoot away. So everybody was doing acrobatics and it looked cool. But the thing we noticed is we didn't want to make ground because it was a lot of work. You might have to make buildings. You might make the, have to make houses, trees, stuff like that. So we said, okay, the entire game is, is above water. It was just a, a quick prototype choice, right? It's above water. So we drew a line for water. And then when the people would fly, when playtesters would fly, all of them would fly close to the water. And we thought, we've seen this. We've seen this in animes, we've seen this in action movies, we've seen this, we've seen this before. When an airplane flies over water, what's the coolest thing? And it's water splashes. So we added water splashes and now everybody kept flying near the water. So now we added water splashes to, bud, to bullets. When a bullet hits the water, there's a water splash. Then we added water, uh, added water splashes to explosions. Now there were big water splashes, right? Now we added water splashes to everything we could think of everything we could think of. And we realized that the game was getting so spectacular. It was getting so cool. Everybody was flying over the water. And we realized that the water splashes were cool. So in the end, we even made the water reflective. 
so that the water splashes above water, you would also see reflected in the water. So suddenly there was twice as many water splashes. And everything, everything in that game was about being cool. That was the only thing that mattered. So in Luftrausers, the core, the heart of the game was being cool. That was it. So people overthink this school thing, people, uh, this core thing. People overthink this, what is at the heart of your game thing? Really what you're looking for is a feeling or a mechanic or something unique that makes your game stand out. Because you would think, aren't there many games about being cool? You tell me, which game is out there about being cool, right? It's not about being unique. It's about doing something that's genuine and understanding what the idea, what the driving force of your work is, right? If your core is the same as a hundred other games, I don't care. As long as you're sincere, as you're genuine and you're focused, right? Now the second layer, that's mechanics. Mechanics are about how the game plays. So in Luftrausers, the airplane game I talked about, the mechanics were very simple. If you pressed up, you moved forward. If you press left and right, the airplane would turn. If you stop pressing up, your airplane would fall, but you could still turn. And then if you press up again, the airplane would fly. If you press X, the airplane would shoot. If you let go of X, the airplane would repair itself. So there was a reason to shoot. There's a reason to not shoot. I always believe it's very important that if there's a reason to press a button, that there also is a reason to not press a button. Now, the trick with mechanics, if you're using this overview, is that if you have a mechanic, say you can turn off the engine and you can turn it back on again and you start flying immediately again, is that a mechanic has to be true to the core. It has to fit the core. It has to point back and what's important about your game. Now there is an exception. Sometimes you need mechanics to support another mechanic. Say you might have a mechanic where enemies keep spawning so players don't really kill them because they can just avoid them, but you need players to kill the enemies so the enemies get angrier over time. That mechanic might not point back to your core, but it might point to another mechanic, right? It might support that mechanic. Now the idea here is that every idea, every mechanic, in this second circle needs to be pointing inwards at the core or pointing sideways at another mechanic. If you're making a game that's cool and you're adding a mechanic that isn't cool, then you should remove the mechanic. It should go away immediately. There is no reason to keep a mechanic that contradicts the heart of your game. The next layer is your declarative layer, which is your visuals, your audio, um, your sound. Um, it is the equivalent of the output layer over here, right? The declarative layer is very important because the declarative layer is what actually communicates the game into our player's brain. So the mechanics are the rules by which the player is playing, but the declarative layer is the way the player is understanding it. So in your declarative layer, it is very important that everything in this layer points inwards at the core, that it points back at the heart of the game, or that it points at a mechanic. Same thing. You look at what you have in terms of visual and you ask yourself, does this support the core or does it contradict it? If it supports the core, keep it in. So those water splashes, that is all declarative. Mechanically, they don't need to be there. They don't do anything. They're just visuals. But in terms of the core, in terms of what matters about the game, they are so important. In terms of the sound, we needed every weapon in that game to sound cool. We needed a soundtrack to sound cool. We needed the graphic style to be cool. We also needed the graphic style to be readable because mechanically that was very important, right? But you see how inwards everything is moving. And you could do that for any of my games. You could do that for Super Crate Box. You could do that for Ridiculous Fishing. You could do that for Nuclear Throne. It is always about everything pointing back inwards at the core 
of the game. Then finally, you've got your meta. Your meta, we're not going to talk about that today, but your meta is your menu, it's your marketing, it's your screenshots, it's your Steam page, it's everything that is not technically part of the game, but is still part of the game. It's your trailers, your Steam page, your Switch page, the interviews you give to people about your game. All of those need to be pointing back. Same thing at either the declarative layer, the mechanical layer, or the core. So if you have a very beautiful game, right, and that supports the core, then you should be talking about how beautiful your game is. If you have a, a very mechanically interesting game or a very interesting mechanic, you should be talking about that. If you have a game that has a, a very interesting core, you should mention the core. For Lufthrausers, the pitch genuinely was be the best fighter pilot in the world. That was it. It was the whole pitch. There was nothing more. Just be the best fighter pilot in the world. So it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to it has to be simple to explain. The core of your game needs to be simple to explain. And the best way to get to the core is to keep asking yourself why somebody would play your game. What are they getting out of it? Are they gonna feel clever? Are they gonna feel challenged? Are they gonna feel happy? Are they gonna be social with their friends? Are they, what is at the heart of your game? What is, what is that? feeling what is that heart that your game wants to avoid if you don't know that you need to know that you need to figure that out it's so important to know what you are making now this next shape is pretty well known but i'm going to go through it anyway in case you do not know it this one is best known as flow theory by mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. and the thing you need to know about flow theory is that we don't actually all agree about it. It is taught everywhere and it's a good thing to know, but it's not necessarily true. Flow theory is very simple. It's the idea that if you have a challenge and you have the player's skill and you graph them against each other, that as the player becomes more skilled, the game should become more challenging. In other words, if a game is too simple for the player's skill level, they'll get bored. And if a game is too hard for a player's skill level or gets too hard for a player's skill level, they get demotivated or frustrated. And the idea is that there is this golden line, this, this line, this evolution of how hard the game is versus how good the player is, that is perfect. That in that state, there's a sense of flow, that feeling that you've lost track of time and that you're fully focused, the thing you're doing. Now, I need you to understand the game theory, game design theory is constantly evolving. And the flow theory is generally disputed, but that at the heart of it is something that was believed for so long that somewhere there has to be a kernel of truth to it. That there's value in understanding the history of game design theory because it might help you understand current game design theory or certain issues about your game. One of the ways I like to think about flow is that flow has to be this zone, but that what's more important about, about flow than staying on that line is that you have sort of like a wave. And that really, the more interesting thing here is the delta, is the change in difficulty. That this part where the difficulty accelerates will give a very different feeling than this part where the, where the difficulty decelerates. That when your player is faced with challenges, that it feels very different from when your player is faced with a relative low in the challenges they face. I think in that regard, there's something really, really simple and powerful about this model. Not in that there is some sort of golden line to adhere to, 
but a way of thinking about what you are serving your player. What does it feel like when your difficulty does something like this? Or what does it feel like when your difficulty does something like that? Or what does it feel like when your difficulty starts very low and then ramps up? Is that fun? Is that pleasant? Is that nice? Do players feel good on that ramp? Do they feel bored by being in the same place? I like to think that a lot of this model is more about acceleration and deceleration than it is about the place you're in. The other way I really like using this chart is as part of, um, of the Dunning-Kruger curve, which is useful, especially for people that are new to games, um, in that it explains how confident people are about their abilities. So when you learn something new at the start, you know that you know nothing, right? You know nothing, but you also know that you know nothing. If I give you an instrument that you've never played, you're not going to go like, I know how to play this. You're going to, oh, what am I supposed to do with this, right? Now, you might practice a song or two on YouTube, and your understanding of how good you are will grow much faster than how good you actually are. You might play Wonderwall by Oasis on a guitar or something. You might think you're good. You might think you're good, but you're not. Obviously, you're not. You've played one song and you've based it on a YouTube tutorial. So when you learn more songs, you might start to realize like, oh, I'm actually not that good at this. And the problem with that, the interesting part with that is that your understanding of your skill level actually goes below where you are with your skill level. And then for the rest of your life, it'll kind of catch back up asymmetrically, but it never quite reaches that line. This part we call overconfidence or mount, mount stupid. This part we call imposter syndrome, right? Now this curve is a little different for everybody. But in general, I like you to remember that if you've never released a commercial game, if you're a student, that you're probably on that mountain. That's okay. We've all been there. Don't worry about that. But the challenges of game design are many. And even after 10 years of being in this industry, I learn something new almost every day. Whether I'm reading a book or talking to somebody else, whether I'm reading uh, news articles about the industry. I keep learning new things. And the more I know, the smaller I feel because there's so much to know out there. There's incredibly, incredible game design theorists writing incredible books about game theory. The entire field of board games, right? There's, there's understanding about marketing, about data analysis, about game design methodology. There's experience to be had in making games, making jam games, practicing, art, music, everything. There's so much. And every time I learn something new, I realize that there's more to still be learned. So keep learning, keep being curious and recognize that you will never know exactly what you know. There will always be more to learn. There will always be more to figure out. If you're happy about that, if that makes you excited, that's a good attitude to have. If you think you know everything, or you want to know everything, this is not going to be a good time for you. Because there is no way to know everything. There's no way to learn everything. And even though a lot of people think of me as an expert, I don't feel that way. I feel like just a game designer, just a game developer, trying to learn new stuff every day. That curiosity, according to a lot of people, that curiosity is what makes me good at my job. Not the knowledge, right? Not the experience per se, although that helps, but the curiosity. If you keep that curiosity, if you protect that curiosity, you'll be fine. The next shape I want to pull your attention to is the mechanic dynamics and aesthetics framework. And like flow theory, I actually do not like the MDA. I personally don't quite believe in it. But the thing you need to know about the MDA is that you've got mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. And the thing I want to point your attention to is that when you look at it, 
Your mechanics are just the rules of, of your game, the actions, the behaviors, the, the stuff that you want to put your player through, right? So this is your mechanics. The aesthetics is very important. The aesthetics is the, the feeling, the, the texture of your game. And just like my core model over here, it is important that you understand that you can't use fun. You can't use gameplay. The MDA creates a number of possible aesthetics for a game, like sensation, fantasy, narrative, uh, challenge, uh, social fellowship, discovery. There's many. There's many, many of them, right? But they're specific words with specific meaning. Now, between your aesthetics and your mechanics lives this interesting thing that I think is the important part to take away from this model. It's your dynamics. And the dynamics are the behavior of the player as they're playing, as they're interacting with your game. The player's doing certain things because the mechanics force them to, and the aesthetics make them want to. And this right here, this is that. This is that player. This is what's happening in the player's head. This is the behavior that comes to exist when a player interacts with your game, right? Those dynamics are critical because that is what the player is actually doing. And if everything's all right, the dynamics are feeding back into the aesthetics for the player. They're making them feel certain ways. They're making them feel the aesthetic that you care about. The mechanics influence the dynamics. Now, what I like about this model and the, the, the epiphany, the, the thing it taught me was that we as developers, this is a terrible smiley face, we are sitting on this side. We are always reasoning from mechanics towards dynamics, towards aesthetics. The mechanics are closest to us. They're the rules, they're what we, they're what we tinker with, they're what our tool set is. The dynamics are generated by that and the aesthetics are our goal. For the player, they actually sit on the other side. The player plays your game because it makes them feel a certain way, right? So they care about the aesthetics and the aesthetics create dynamics and the dynamics are informed by the mechanics. And we are sitting at opposite ends of how we look at that game. And because we're sitting at opposite ends, we can't say whether the game works. We can't say whether it's functional. All we can say is we think theoretically, even if you've prototyped it, that these mechanics will create dynamics that will generate the aesthetic that we want. The only way for us to know is to play test, is to try to let people interact with the game. And when we do, we might get an insight in what aesthetic is driving the dynamics and what are the dynamics fit the mechanics. So this one is important in that regard. Now, finally, the final shape, and this is more of a philosophical shape. Good design, good development, good anything is not about being a better designer. It's not about being a better developer. I believe that being a better game creator is to be a better human, it's to be a more complete human. That's why I personally don't believe that you should be reading game design books all the time or playing other video games all the time. No, what I believe is that you should go out there and live an interesting life. Do interesting things. Do things you wouldn't do. Make games and genres that you hate. Listen to music you don't like. Watch movies that are old, right? Go do stuff. Because when people say everything is a remix, they don't mean everything is A plus B. They mean that our brain does this thing where it's mixing information in weird ways all the time just to see what is useful as a mix. And how the creative process works 
if your pre creative process is correct, if your creative process is working, is that you always have a lot of everything. And that the trick of being creative is not about finding ideas, it's about focusing into ideas. Your brain has a million ideas every moment. A lot of them are bad. A lot of ideas are bad. Want to make a game? Have a game idea right now. Game about a, um, a dog chasing an airplane that's about to take off. It's a bad idea. There's no way it's a good game, but it's an idea, right? And there might be something interesting there. And the idea of focusing that down into something coherent, focusing that down into what is effectively a core for a game, right? Um, that's, that's creativity. So creativity is easier if you have more everything. So just being a better game designer, just being a better game developer is not enough. You have to be a more complete human. You have to be a more curious human. You have to have more knowledge as a human. That's how you become creative. Not through exercises, not through a uh, ritual, even though all of those things can help. But ultimately, it's about more everything, more everything. And then narrowing it down into something focused, something small, something worthwhile, something that can sit at the core of your game that can drive a player, that can drive that aesthetic. Because when you think about this chart, really all of this is connected, right? This makes a core. The core drives your dynamics, right? It might be an aesthetic. Your mechanics, they go right here, right? Your mechanics are affected by the flow of difficulty. Your nouns are your declarative layer. Your verbs are your mechanics. Your mechanics are in the game, but your aesthetics drive what the player thinks. All of this is connected. And I'm not going to draw all of this out because I want you to think about how these shapes connect to each other. Why these shapes connect to each other. Now, every time I give this talk, I make a quick photo of the end result. So I'm just going to make a quick photo of my screen. Give me one second. There we go. Very happy about that. Um, oh, I can just hit save. I a long live Zoom. Um, these are the six shapes that I use to be a better game designer, to be a better games thinker, to think about games more critically. Can I, for another game, figure out the circles, right? Can I, for a production that I'm watching or working on, can I separate noun from verb? Can I figure out the intent? Can I figure out what the player should be thinking? Can I figure out how it falls onto flow? Can I figure out the aesthetics? It helps me understand why games are the way they are. It helps me understand why games should be a certain way. And as with everything in game design, there's no one right answer. You might have your own methods. You might have your own way of getting to these. These six have helped me. Hope that at least one of them will help you. We'll take some time for questions. Thank you so much uh, for listening to my talk. I think I have a few minutes left. So let's go really quick through those questions. Okay, thanks for your amazing presentation. Thank you. Uh, I've been here taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I took, a, I took a screenshot of this, but people are free to take screenshots to keep this, whatever, that's all good. Okay, uh, we have a question from Sergan Turan. Okay. Uh, okay, let me interpret this sure at first. In some uh, is it logical that making uh, games uh, starting from uh, human psychological? Um, wait for a second. <laughs> No, take your time. Uh, human psychological satisfactions. Yeah, I mean, in the end, that's what we're doing, right? We are smoke and mirrors. We're magicians. We're just magicians. We're like, we, you might as well give us a deck of cards and do magic tricks with it, right? The, the real job of a game designer is to make people feel things. Honestly, the real job of a game designer is to lie. We're lying. Our entire job is lying, it's misdirection. 
those polygons, they're not real characters. And those numbers, they're not real scores. We just, conv we just trained a piece of it. We trained a piece of silicon in a computer to be manipulated by electricity in such a way that a screen shows certain lights and a speaker makes certain sounds so that in the brain of the player, they're convinced they're listening to a real person. That's our job. Our job is to lie, right? Our job is to be a magician. So when you think about that, that way, then yes, the only goal we have is to make something happen in their brain, to trick people into believing something, to give people a feeling of feeling good, feeling challenged, feeling safe, feeling open to experimenting, feeling whatever it is that they feel, right? That's our goal. It's the only goal we have. There is no goal that is make a good game. It doesn't exist. No such thing. What is good? How do you define good? The only thing we can do is make people feel stuff. Whether that's tension, anxiety, happiness, sadness, I don't care. Doesn't, it's not relevant which one you make people feel. If you make people feel, you've succeeded. The only way that you'll succeed ever is by making people feel. So yeah, our entire job is about tricking people. It's about psychology. It's about technology. Um, but in the end, the end result is always human. Games are a conversation that we're having via a computer. And that might sound very philosophical and it might sound abstract, but you know what? That's how it is. It's our job. We're having a chat with our player and we're training a computer to have the chat on our behalf. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we have another question from uh, Joris. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. Royals uh, from Greetings Games. Uh, he asks, because us devs are on the opposite side of the players, wouldn't it make sense to start playtesting before even starting development, trying to discover what people like and dislike in a certain genre? That's absolutely one option. Uh, market research can be a really big part of your game design. There's different schools of where you start and where you end with game design. And some people like to start from data. And that's a very genuine, very accurate place to start, right? That said, that will make your work always based on people's expectations. And the trick about design is that, you know, the old story about if, if the people back in the days when everything was horse and carriage would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse or a bigger carriage. Nobody would have said a car, right? Because that was not within the, the realm of possibility. Whether you want to be a designer that is a dreamer and that comes up with new ideas and then tests them, or whether you want to be a designer that is um, more economical and that tests what play people want and then builds according to that, there's no better way of doing it. There's no morally more correct way of doing it. There's no ethically more correct way of doing it, right? You're not a better designer if you pull ideas out of thin air. You're not a worse designer if you're pulling your games out of data. And you're not a better designer if you're basing your game on data only. You're not a worse designer if you're making, making ideas up on the fly. The only thing that's true is that you have to validate whether your design works, whether your game works. And the only way to do that is play testing, right? The only way to do that is to let people interact with your work. So where you start, it's not that important. As long as while you're iterating, you're testing and you're testing as soon as possible. I do believe that is necessary to test as, as soon as you have a prototype, start testing. Because from that point on, you're iterating. And to iterate, you have to remember that we are on opposite sides. Wow, I just turned the entire screen black. Uh, I don't know what happened. Well, that's too bad. Um, but yeah. The, um, the importance at that point really is to make sure that, to make sure that you play test and you validate your assumptions. Okay, we, we can have one last question. Let's do one more. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's coming from an anonymous attendee. Uh, he asks, uh, what are the critical points of restricting the players by the rules or how much should we free the players in games? Right. That's a very good question. The, the, the reality in their question and what this person is saying is that 
there is no right answer to almost any question in game design. For certain games, the aesthetic might be more exploratory. The aesthetic might be more about playfulness. And a lot of games like that create a sandbox, like Minecraft might do, or like Roblox might do, or like open world games like Grand Theft Auto might do, or even um, games in which you can make your own character build. Those tend to be very open in what you do because the aesthetic of the game fits that. There's also a lot of more linear games where the game is very focused. It tells you here, go here, do this, do that. And even though there's agency, there's the feeling of having control over what happens. Really, you're on a roller coaster. You can't get off the rails. You can't go a certain place. Maybe there might be a few spots where you can go left or right. But the game just goes forward. And the aesthetic of that might be more narrative. It might be more instructive. It might be more prescriptive, right? The games are more controlled. There's no better experience between the two. There's no correct way of making games. It's just the one type of design will create the one aesthetic of game and the other type of design will create the other aesthetic of game. Now, obviously it's important to think about how does that fit in the market? What do people want? What are the expectations for a certain type of game, for a certain type of aesthetic? But at the heart, there's no better or worse answer. There might be answers that are more relevant to how the industry is nowadays. And there might be answers that are less relevant to how the industry is nowadays. But either way, it's correct. The only thing you can do wrong, I believe, as a creative, as, as a person who works in a field where there is no right answer and you can't get graded for what you do, maybe a Metacritic will try, but it's nonsense. Really, the only thing you can do is make informed choices. You can't make good choices. You can't make bad choices. All you can do is make sure that when you make a choice, the information that you have at that point feels complete and feels like you have enough information to make that choice. And sometimes you run out of time and you just have to make a choice, right? Sometimes when I get stuck and I can't figure things out, I flip a coin. I, didn't, I have a coin sitting right here. I flip the coin. I catch it. I check whether it's head or tails. I say heads is option A, tails is option B. I flip the coin, it lands, I look at it, and I check whether my feelings are disappointed. If it's heads for option A and I'm disappointed, that means something. It means I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. I should do something else, right? I think that's important. That's important to remember. It's important to realize. So don't think about game design necessarily in terms of right or wrong. Think about how does this support what I'm trying to do? How does this strengthen where I'm trying to get? How does this fit in the market? How does this fit in my audience's expectation? If you think about games that way, rather than right, wrong, better, worse, right? Correct, incorrect. You'll find that this is a beautiful craft. That is not a craft about, it's not a flow chart. It's a medium. It's an art, it's a question mark. And that's the exciting part is that it's a question mark. It's also the difficult part because there's no right answer. Because there's no right answer, very frequently you might feel lost. You might feel confused, you might feel uncertain. But as long as you can go back to those six shapes and figure out where it all fits, why it all fits, why it's supposed to work, I think you'll, you'll find that you'll have a good time in video games. Okay, thanks a lot again for joining uh, for your sure amazing thing. presentation. Absolutely. Also, uh, uh, Bug Game Lab, Bakhtisha University founder, Bug Game Lab founder, Gwen he says hi, and it's great to host you again. <laughs> A pleasure to be back. Um, yeah, uh, one more thing for everybody listening. If you have any questions that you were too nervous to ask or you didn't want to ask them in public or they're a little too complicated to do during a Q&A, if you are on Twitter, find me on Twitter, T-H-A underscore Rami. If I'm in Twitter, check out my pinned tweet. There's a link there that allows you to book a quick meeting with me to talk about your specific issue. It's free. Uh, feel free to use the free 20 minute one uh, and we will talk about your game. I understand that this is, you know, things have to go quick. We don't have that much time. Feel free to use that. Uh, I would love to help. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, in, on your weekend day. I understand it's your weekend. I understand you're here. 
because you care about game design because otherwise you'd be, you know, doing something else. So thanks so much for being here. And thank you uh, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you so you. much. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Hope, hopefully we will see you again. Hopefully. Next events. Uh, yep. Thanks again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.